It was the coldest May day on record when we came ashore in Outer Harbour, South Australia. On a wet May morning, we landed in Outer Harbour. Together with our parents, we left Ukraine towards the end of the war, basically fleeing ahead of the uh, Soviet army. We were on the choppy seas for 30 days on the ship Oxfordshire. We fled Ukraine in 1944 with the German army. Uh, we stayed in several places under really horrible conditions until eventually we ended up in New Ulm, which was made into a displaced persons camp, uh, chiefly by UNRWA. Uh, they supplied us with food, clothes. We lived in Bavaria, from where we had a choice to migrate either to Argentina or Australia. Eventually we chose Australia as our, our destination, probably by default because uh, the more popular destinations of Canada and the United States were just simply too unachievable. Australia was hardly known, um, but it was the furthest away from the communists and it was easier eventually to get to, although a lot of the people in Australia had to be persuaded that only the best people would be um, emigrating. When we were called up, we then had to go to Augsburg, where we had to go through awful health checks and immunizations. Women and girls in one big room, all undressed and having uh, some sort of powder sprinkled from head to toe. Most of the story from there on seems to be medical after medical after medical. We're constantly being um, disinfected or blood tested or x-rayed. We were in Augsburg for about a month and then were taken by train to Naples. In Naples, we were in a camp surrounded by wire, a wire fence. It was very dirty, we were behind barbed wire fence and the children that I saw peeking through were, looked even in worse condition than we were. People could take a day pass to go and have a look at the city. I stood there by the fence watching people going by on the other side. And one day, a little boy and his father <clears throat> came up to me and passed me a blood orange. I had never seen a blood orange, or for that matter, any orange before. Camp wasn't exactly in Naples. We had to go to Naples, catch a train, which took us straight to the, to the ship, and we boarded immediately. We all tagged. Everybody had to wear a little name tag with a number. Or incidentally, we discovered this camera after my father died years later and we fished out the film and it was still intact and we had the um, photographs developed. You know, I was 12 and a bit. For me, it was quite an adventure. My parents had actually promised both Lou and I that we'd get ponies because they saw Australia as a sort of a country a frontier country. We were going to have ponies and there were going to be kangaroos jumping down the streets. My parents were told, you won't need much when you're going to a warm, tropical country. Oh yeah, yeah. The first part of the journey seemed to go very quickly. From Naples down to Port Said and then into the Suez Canal. I can't say that Oxfordshire was a, a luxury liner. And the passenger accommodation was two big dormitories. My stepmother was in the women's dormitory and my brother and our father and I were, were in the men's dormitory. A room uh, with hammock-like beds in between poles. The adults were responsible for cleaning. The major laundry was done by the crew, but everything else was done by the passengers. The life on board was seemed to be punctuated by the two records that the ship had. They were 78 RPM records. One was My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, and I can't remember what the flip side of that one was. And the other one was Manana is good enough for me, and I certainly learnt the words to that by the end of the voyage. And on the other side was I didn't know the gun was loaded. And I am so sorry, my friend. And it's a song that I don't think I heard in Australia, but 
it must have been a hit at that particular time. We were hit by seasickness and the constant aroma of boiled mutton wafting from the kitchen didn't help much. The main bits of food that impressed me were the big navel oranges which were South Australian navel oranges and they were just scrumptious, big, juicy, wonderful. When I sort of was in a position to try and look for them in South Australia, I couldn't find them. Soon after we got on board ship, we all received seven pounds, which meant that we had some spending money and it came in handy. We went then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. The tenders came to fill the ship with water and fuel, etc. And, uh, and then we'd be surrounded by, by people in small boats with things to sell. Really army of uh, vendors descended on the boat. Uh, there were a lot of sort of handicraft type things particularly particularly little elephants, uh, black and brown, and uh, some with ivory tusks. Our parents bought a set of elephants that actually lasted as long as both my first daughters, and that became the only Ukrainian word that they actually learnt. So they knew slonik, which was not exactly useful for starting a Ukrainian conversation. Our very first English word, k a t cat. That's the only word we knew when we had disembarked later. The lingua franca on the boat was German. So we all spoke German to each other across the nations. We disembarked went through customs and I remember feeling very, very pissed off with the customs because they didn't bother to look at anything that we brought in. We were taken by train to Woodside Army Camp. I remember the corrugated iron buildings that we had to sleep in. The room was a big, long room with partitions of blankets hanging down to separate families and also give them a bit of privacy. We found that we couldn't sleep because you're actually trying to fall asleep in a pyramid of ice-cold air. So we managed to get rid of the top sheets and even though the blankets were a little bit scratchy, they were nice and warm. The water would be frozen in the mornings, but during the day it wasn't too bad. Once a week, I think, with visiting teachers. I can't remember if it was the first or the second day at school, I saw people kicking a very funny shaped ball. I went close to kids kicking the ball, and I don't know whether it was deliberate to get at one of these funny foreigners, or whether it was accidental, but I got the ball full in the face from about two metres. When I got off the bus at Woodside Camp, my mother didn't actually recognise me. I looked more Chinese than Ukrainian at that particular time. It wasn't particularly painful, but it was a hell of an introduction to Australian rules football. For the children, as you say, it was fun and adventure. But our poor parents, it was hardship and heartbreak. They went through a very hard time. It was uh, an encounter of mother and child, which our mother kept dearly with her all the time. First in the suitcase, then when we arrived in Australia, it was always in our house. My mother was very young when she left her mother back in Ukraine. Her mother must have given it to her when they were leaving, just to keep us all safe. If you look at the ship's manifest, uh, the, the ship's manifest item about our family is Meron Miketa, labourer, Vasilena Miketa, housewife, and then child, child. You know. They took no notice whatever of, of anyone's qualifications. 
and uh, to their to Australia, you were, were they were all labourers, and uh, to to become to have your profession recognised, people had to virtually start from the very beginning. Some did, but uh, in the, the railway gang that uh, that our dad was on, he was an accountant uh, in uh, in Ukraine. I think he was he was determined to study law, but I don't think he ever got around to that. When we first left Woodside and uh, started living outside, we were called all sorts of names, names like bloody New Australians, Wogs, and all the other names. But we didn't take too much notice of that. We were looked down upon, but in school we had this sort of, we felt, had this advantage of, because we were bilingual and because we had such a strong Ukrainian culture, background in culture, and that we were allowed to continue with this culture in Australia. Our weekends were Ukrainian, even though we couldn't, wouldn't speak Ukrainian when we were on public transport because some idiot would scream out, speak English, why don't you? Or go back where you came from. I did have some resentment outside the school. I did have a feeling, I was fairly naive, but I think I got the message. One guy in particular was sort of thinking, oh, you know, these, these new Australians at that stage, I think we were being called, um, are taking our jobs, not taking into account that these new Australians we were working two or three jobs, anything they could get hold of, jobs that the Aussies generally didn't particularly want. Up until April 1950, I went through school just not really listening to what was going on because I didn't understand what was going on. Then, and it was during an algebra lesson, I still remember that, I suddenly realised that I could understand what the teacher was saying. We had to, to try very, very hard at school and uh, uh, because we, we began to understand just, just what our parents had, had paid for, you know, for our education and uh, I remember feeling guilty if, you know, if I didn't top the class or you know, something like that. I basically felt that I, I could succeed in both cultures. and. Uh, I didn't have to give up my Ukrainianness. I never did. I had a sense of belonging, but also a sense of pride of my heritage, my Ukrainian heritage, and a sense of pride in my Australian heritage.